Do you believe robots will be sentient? I do. I think that there may be a path. How did you get into robotics? Working at Disney, I started as a sculptor, but then I did have the chance to go into robotics at Disney. When you decided to start a robotics company? The name of the company was Human Emulation Robotics. Emulation means to destroy with fire. The material behind Sophia, like the reporters asked me at the time, what is this material that you've created? I didn't have a name for it. I was like, a rubber? I really want to buy the little Sophia. It takes millions of dollars. What's coming next? Sophia would be... All right, guys, today we have the guest I've been looking forward to for a really long time, David Hansen, the founder of Hansen Robotics. Yeah, David, it's really good to have you on the show. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. Initially, I thought you were inspired by the movie Simone by Al Pacino, which came out in 2002. But then I found out you built your first humanoid robot in 1995. 1993, yeah. So I'm guessing they were inspired by you. Oh, uh, probably not. The first humanoid robot that I made was not very famous. I just exhibited it at an art science technology festival called Pong, which was a cross-institutional thing between Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design. I was an undergraduate student at the time, but I was very interested in artificial intelligence, the combination of arts and humanoid robots, and uh, this idea of bridging these different disciplines for the benefit of them all was uh, very strong with me. Those ideas seemed far-fetched at the time to many people, but they really drove me from a young age. So how did you get into robotics? Like, I'm guessing you're in your 20s, like stumbling around. Like, what was the inspiration or who guided you to get into robotics? I was a pretty nerdy kid. So as a teenager, I was familiar with the work of Marvin Minsky and um, the robots coming out of the media lab and so forth. And I had these interests in art, figurative art, and time music and fiction writing it was very strong. And I was most interested in artificial intelligence. So I took artificial intelligence programming classes. I joined the Brown University Robotics Club I was doing this degree in film animation video at Rhode Island School of Design and weaving in the robots that I was building into some of the films that I was making. And how these things intersect to me is just like, you know, the truth of the way these disciplines work, the di disciplinary boundaries are convention. And what we do with it is our own decision. We can be as creative as we want. So these were ideas that really enlivened and motivated me and they were difficult to grapple with. For a little bit of context, there was no large language models. Now when people think of AI, it's, they think of ChatGPT, correct? You're talking about the 90s. People didn't even know what AI means. There were chatbots. They were pretty much all expert system-based chatbots. Speech recognition was working, but just in a rudimentary way. So there was some computer vision. And looking at these things through the lens of a greater creativity can be really empowering. Empowering to young, young people like me when I was in my 20s. And then when I was working at Disney, I started as a sculptor, making you know sculpted figures because I like drawing have a knack for doing figurative drawing and figurative 3D. So you had a more artistic background or more engineering background? It's hard to say. I would dive pretty deep in each of these areas. I mean, I didn't have an engineering degree, but I knew basic electronics. I could put together um, things. I knew C programming, C, some C++ programming. I had programmed a little bit of Lisp to make the robot not bump into the, into the halls at Brown. So in a sense, I was a tinkerer. I also didn't study sculpture, actually. I jumped in, somebody asked, could I do it? I said, I I think I could. There was no try. YouTube. But you know, if you just jump in and try to figure something out, you don't hold back. If you don't, you realize that maybe there's a script running that says you can't. And if that script is deep and always telling you, if you if it's not proven, then you can't. This is a script that actually probably runs deep in a lot of us. It like, creates a kind of fear when we hit the unknown. So if you can unwind that a bit and get comfortable in these uncomfortable risk-taking situations, jumping into disciplines that you don't know, you can learn a lot more. And I would hold myself to very high standards when I would do these things. So if I was going to do some portraiture or drawings, if I was sitting with a friend or what have you, I wanted it somehow soak in the information of that person and their personality would shine through that. So I was very passionate about it in other words. And so when I went to work as a sculptor for like two and a half years, I was very prolific and made a lot of work and my heart was in those works. What were they? Were they robots or were they just... They were like things for those two and a half years, mostly for theme parks. So some for Universal Studios 
Sophia's Islands of Adventure, the themed resort called Atlantis in the Bahamas, sort of mythical creatures and for Disney. So I had this strange portfolio and resume with these with these things. And I was offered a job doing 3D development for a video game company in Boston and then doing online development for a uh, prodigy at the time. And then the sculpting job that would be uh, working for a contractor for Disney and these other theme park things. So learning fast was a thing and I, I was pleased that it was good and then hired directly to work for Disney, which is, was an amazing experience. And I had a lot of great mentors and I'm really proud of the works. It, you know, I learned a lot, but then I did have the chance to go into robotics at Disney. So then I got to propose research projects and write research papers and get these things funded and go to conferences and meet people in the world of AI and robotics. How much of that was behind the computer or how much was, because most nerds love computer, but you're kind of like different. You you like to sculpt with hand and... Yeah, I do both and yeah. back and forth between uh, working digitally and working in the domains of, the, of learning the science and applying the science. I want to get back to the material because a lot of people surface level, they don't know what Frubber is. I want to ask you, how were you able to patent like Frubber and like the material behind Sophia? Like, and it, this has been 18 years in the making. So I want to hear the story behind it. Yeah, so the first formulas for Frubber came in 2002. So it's 22 years ago. I was exploring different ways of achieving highly elastic porous polymers. The silicones, I wasn't quite getting to be good, but in 2002 and 2003, I made about six different robot faces. By that time, I had developed a lot of robots along the way with a lot of experimentations in different kinds of these foam rubber materials. So I had some pretty good results along the way, but very little attention for what these robots were. And then a press conference uh, was held and everybody, all the reporters wanted to see the humanoid robot, the, yeah. the one humanoid. Robot that they can take a photo of. They take photo and interview. And so I pull this thing out and it's making these facial expressions yeah. and photo are going off and it became a cover story for popular science and all these things. But the reporters asked me at the time, what is this material that you've created? I didn't have a name for it. I was like, a for rubber? What does it stand for? What does that mean? You were gonna say rubber. Face rubber. Uh, no, I was, I just was thinking the words face and rubber and it just kind of like fell out of my mouth and it stuck. And we haven't thought of a better word for it since then. So it's a good word. Yeah, yeah. so 2003, I filed uh, the patents on a wide variety of things, the software and the hardware and the materials. And so then you go to 2007, you decided to start a robotics company. No, 2003, I founded Hanson Robotics. Hanson Robotics, I found it in 2003. Yeah, you gotta correct that, by the way. Google says 2007. <laughs> you can't always control what Google's gonna tell you. You're right about that. And there's a lot of information out there, but the company was founded in 2003. We changed the name. The first name of the company was actually Human Emulation Robotics. That's why. And it was very awkward. <laughs> Human Emulation Robotics. What? Human Emulation Robotics? Emulation means to destroy with fire. Handsome Robotics flows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I had um, some mentors who, uh, executives who came in and mentored me starting in 2003, 2004. And um, by 2005, one of them, Lou Schwartz, said, you've got to change the name. Let's call it Hanson Robotics. Okay, <laughs> you know, all right. I want to ask you about Little Sophia for a second. I actually was telling my partner, I was like, I really want to buy the Little Sophia yeah. and put it on my desk and ask it questions daily. And you know, my idea was, what if the robot could initiate the conversation even though it's creepy a little bit. I would like that. Yeah, good. <laughs> Me too. You know, because I feel like a lot of time, time people don't use ChatGPT because they have to do the work of asking. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have any plans to like sell the little Sophia? Oh, absolutely. We designed it that way. Um, the problem with these robots is getting people to believe in this interesting agglomeration of art and engineering is really hard. Engineers are like, what's that art thing? I don't believe in it. It's not real engineering. You know, people from like existing arts industries, like um, the toy industry, they're like this AI thing, they're not sure about it. So it's hard to get people to leap and trust. So we haven't actually been able to raise the funds yet, yeah. honestly, to finish the manufacturing on this because it takes millions of dollars. Do you believe robots will be sentient? I do. I think that we may have the right architecture for it. And just like, you know, people didn't believe in 
you know, these neural nets for a long time and you feed it the right data, once you give it the right belief, it's not just the data, it's the compute time, the resources. Then neural networks started showing these great leaps forward. And then once you have a culture of belief, then you can have something like Google Brain, which gave rise to Transformers. And so that culture of innovation leads to these breakthroughs. And now people are starting to believe in artificial general intelligence and the prospect of machine consciousness. You have a lot of people who will say, no, you haven't proven it can be done. You haven't proven how consciousness actually works. And of course that can dampen uh, things and dampen progress. But the thing is that there may be a path. I think there is a path. So we saw with ChatGPT, a lot of white collar jobs getting affected. Now we're seeing companies like Figure and all yeah. the, they're raising billions of dollars to replace the blue collar jobs. Mainly they want to replace the industrial workers and then they'll come for the uh, household jobs as well. What do you think about that? People have been worried about this um, you know, since maybe the 18th century, certainly yeah. since the 19th century. The Luddite movement stopped the textile factories, did not like, shut down the economy. It created an enormous amount of wealth, but also it does create a lot of turbulence, sort of social turbulence and social change. It doesn't mean that it's all good, but we are seeing more productivity. I mean, that's automation including artificial intelligence and robotics, especially when you start to see more general purpose AI and robotics, then you're going to see more abundance. It's up to us humans to decide ethically what we're going to do with those abundance. Do we accumulate it into an increasingly thin layer of ultra wealthy people and keep just sucking resources out of the ecosystem? Or do we apply it to make the world better? What's the future of Hanson Robotics? I'm excited about the little Sophia as well, but can you tell everyone what's coming next? Hanson Robotics is developing next waves of artificial intelligence. And so we had some interesting studies that was showing glimmers of consciousness in Sophia, mathematically tested using the integrated information theory. And I believe that that's not fully indicative, but it is interesting. And I think our latest architecture is the way that we're going. I think that we can make a huge difference. So Sophia would be more motivated, more autonomous, able to then learn more effectively, spontaneously. Hanson Robotics is a company that cares about the people and about the future. So we would be doing this in a way where we're sharing open source tools, open source technologies, trying to help people all around the world to participate in the AI revolution. So it's not just um, hands-on robotics that benefit, you know, so-called first world. And the future is not just AI brain power, but actualizing human brain power. Because humans and AI working together are far smarter than either independent. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate your time and everything. Like you've been very generous with me. Thank you so much. Thank you.